S-T-E-M 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 Science, technology, engineering, and math S-T-E-M 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 Science, technology, engineering, and math Hi, I'm Jesse, And for some of us, words like science, technology, engineering, and math might seem scary. Jesse, you're absolutely right. They can really be intimidating. But when you really get to know how science, technology, engineering, and math are a part of our everyday lives, it then becomes interesting and fun, not so boring. Hey, a good example of that is gaming. Who doesn't love gaming? Uh, you know, he's right. Gaming fits into science, technology, engineering, and math. By the way, let's abbreviate science, technology, engineering, and math by calling it STEM. Yeah, short and sweet. Just remember what it means. So, listen, would you like to learn more about STEM? Well, let's just talk about science first. The S in STEM. Yeah, I'm going to show you how science fits in the gaming world and how you can be a part. Just follow me. S-T-E-M 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 Science, technology, engineering, and math. Yeah! Now this is gaming. There's nothing like being in the action. I guess literally, in my case. It's hard to believe that something so fun can be connected to science. Yeah, science can be cool. So, what does science have to do with gaming? Well, you can make a good living by designing games. That's right, you can have a career in science and still have fun. Well, take for instance this racing game. You have to understand things like acceleration, inertia, friction, and time. Now, these are things that we experience in our everyday lives, right? For instance, you feel acceleration as a car goes faster. You feel inertia as you turn a corner and are pressed against the door. Friction keeps the car on the road so it doesn't just fly off the turn. And time is a measurement that can be applied to speed. There are actually guys who work for game companies who figure all this stuff out. So science can be pretty cool. The world needs young people like you and I to learn about science and take it to the next level. Are you interested? Join the computer science or information technology program at your school. Don't have one? Why not talk to your teacher about different ways that you can get involved in science now? Don't wait. Now is the time to start. Now let's see how technology, the T in STEM, can be just as fun and how you can get involved. Wow, Paul. That's good info. You really did a great job explaining that. But let's talk about the T in STEM, technology. I'm going to show you guys how technology can be just as fun and how you can get involved. Hey, I'm in the gaming world to show you how technology really rocks. Now, when I think of technology, I think of all the girls and guys that actually create the 3D animation for games. Now, this may all sound intimidating, but it's not as hard as you think. High-tech software and basic training go a long way to help you get involved. And it's fun. The basics are taught in most technical schools and colleges. With the right technology and your creative mind, imagine what you could do. The world needs people just like you to do great things with technology, so don't waste time. If you have a graphics or media program at your school, join now or speak to your school counselor today and get involved. S-T-E-M 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 Science, technology, engineering, and math. It's good to know how technology applies to the gaming world, Jess. I never thought of technology in that way. Thanks. Well, if you thought that technology was great, wait until you see how great engineering can be. Hey! Imagine being able to create your own Xbox 360. You would modify it and trick it out for sure. Well, that's what electronic engineers do every day. They engineer, or design, the guts of a gaming system. And if you can build your own Xbox, then you can build your own iPod, computer, or whatever. Engineering can be fun, and building your own tech toys can be just as fun. And you can make them do anything you'd like. The possibilities are endless! Did you know that you can get into engineering while you're still in school? Some schools have a technology or robotics program. If not, talk to your parents today and ask them to help you get involved. Ever listen to the hot music tracks that you find on most games? Would you believe that it takes math to make that music? It takes math to play music and to get a good mix. That's why we're here, to see how it's done. 
Music studios are full of technology, but it takes math to understand music. For instance, to read music, you have to know fractions, and you have to know how to count in beats. You also have to understand mathematic ratios when applying effects to your composition. When it all comes together, you get one great track. S T E M, S T E M, S T E M. Science, technology, engineering, and math. Do you see how you can have an exciting career using math? Learn more by reaching out to a mentor or community center in your area, or get involved with a music program at your school. Don't wait until tomorrow. Get involved now. So you see, STEM can be fun. You can make a career out of being a scientist, technologist, engineer, or mathematician. What's more is that you can have fun while doing it. Yeah. Science, technology, engineering, and math show up in our everyday lives. So why not show your interest by getting involved in STEM now? Just think, what you're learning now. Well, it will go a long way. Just look for science. Technology, engineering, or mathematics programs at your school, or check out these websites with your teacher or parent. Get involved! S T E M, S T E M, S T E M. Science, technology, engineering, and Hi, my name is Shai, and I work at the Stratasys Chemistry R&D Department. Today, I want to share with you a cool idea that we had. We call it, How Far Can You Go? This will be a series of challenges that will encourage you to explore how far you can go with your designs and with 3D printing technology. The first challenge is to design a catapult that can throw a ball, um, a 3D printed ball, of course, as far as possible. The guidelines for this challenge, as well as design tips, are with the additional material on our web page. But now, I want to show you some models that will give you an idea of what is possible and how I approach this challenge. This is the first concept that I designed. This is a modular design. This is the base. This is the spring arm that throws the ball, which slots into here. This is the cup that holds the ball, which slots into here. And this is how the complete catapult works. This modular design allowed me to test different variables. For example, I could print different spring arms with different thicknesses and also with different materials. This design also has a trigger that holds the catapult when it's ready to fire. And you can see here that the, the axis for the trigger has been printed in the same piece with the base of the catapult. This is the second design that I tried. This is something more like a slingshot. You can see that I tense it like this and release it. But I was not very happy with this design. It was not as powerful as the first one. And I think that this uh, type of design is not very suitable for rigid materials. You know, it probably works much better with a rubber band. This is the final design, the winning design. And you can see here that the entire structure is actually a spring. You can see as I draw it back and release, the entire structure deforms and throws the ball. There's only a very minimal amount of reinforcement, the legs here and the reinforcement here, just to hold the structure together, but otherwise the entire structure is a spring. These are the designs we came up with, and now we would like to throw the ball back to you and see how far you can go. Now it's your turn to come up with your own new and exciting designs. You can upload images, videos, STL files, even written materials to our Facebook page and the Stratasys blog.
My name is Jason Bell. I'm a mechanical engineer during the week, and for the last 20 years, a base jumper on the weekends. My human catapult project began several years ago with two main goals. Number one, to keep my engineering skills sharp, and number two, the catapult would become an exciting instrument used to launch base jumpers over the edge of the 876 foot tall New River Gorge Bridge during Bridge Day. Since base jumpers have always sought new ways to enjoy the sport, a pneumatically powered catapult system capable of launching jumpers up to 20 feet high and 50 feet away from the bridge railing just might keep them busy for a while. The catapult is now ready for a human being. Six, five, four, three, two, one. As you might expect, one cannot simply Google how to build a human catapult system as there are only a handful in existence around the world. Since my design was focused on launching base jumpers over a bridge, it added additional complexity in accommodating jumpers with parachutes on the backs and large crowds located close to the action. This catapult had to be powerful and reliable, yet mobile and self-powered. Seeing my catapult come to life and being launched into Maple Lake for the first time was one of the best days of my life. I'll never forget the adrenaline rush of being thrust into the back of the chair, diving into the water, and then screaming like a carefree schoolgirl after taking my first breath of air. With the success of our water test, it was time to take the catapult to Bridge Day. As you'll see, even the most experienced space jumpers with decades of parachuting experience were noticeably scared. Hey. <laughs> Fire up that catapult. Okay, are you ready, Joe? Yep. All right, here goes the first catapult launch. In, in five. We've got the thumbs up. Three, two, one, and fire. Party on! Ready? Yep! In five, four, three, two, one. See ya. Alright. No wait! <laughs>
Few weapons command respect like an aircraft carrier. They are the largest surface warships ever built, symbols of the modern age of war. And yet, they have a secret. The modern aircraft carrier can't do its job without an essential piece of hardware that is 2,000 years old. In a message fragment from ancient Egypt, a deadly long-range weapon is described that relied only on the power of air. In the ancient world, the catapult was the technological front-runner in the arms race. It had the ability to store and release far more energy than a single man could possibly unleash. The stored energy is known as potential energy. Nearly all throwing devices use the same operating principle. They convert potential energy into kinetic energy. And the potential energy is either stored in some form of elastic, be it twisted rope or elastic bands in the form of a handheld catapult. A trebuchet stores the energy in gravity by having the weights held up high. And all that happens is that you then release the potential energy and convert that into the kinetic energy that's in the missile. The standard catapult in the ancient world was the torsion catapult. Torsion catapult works by twisting up fibers which can retain energy while cocking the mechanism so that the arms of the catapult are actually linked up to the torsion and the trigger then releases all of that energy by unwinding whatever you've wound up. The materials used were animal sinew, hemp and stretched leather. Using only organic fibers, a common torsion-heavy catapult in the Roman army could unleash two and a half megajoules of potential energy. Enough power to shoot a 130 kilo missile for over half a kilometer. But in 280 BC, in the Egyptian city of Alexandria, a new world-changing technology science was in its infancy. Once you go to using iron, it's a non-perishable material. You get a more reliable performance. You're not dealing with perishable sinews, hemp fibers. These are things that are going to deteriorate quite quickly in use. The ability to work metal to precision allowed the creation of airtight seals in pneumatic systems. We all now take in the modern world pneumatics for granted. All the buses and trucks that people travel in, um, they all have pneumatic brakes. Message fragments from ancient Egypt hint at the ambition to harness this power for war. The idea that somebody then harnessed pneumatics to make a, a missile firing device really stand out as a, as a bit of sort of advanced thinking at the time. Scientists today can use these ancient references to construct a model of the machine 2,000 years later. The design shows one of the first pistons in history. The piston used by Tisibius is the first example of a piston. Uh, and if we can see one here, it's basically a cylinder with a loose end. And as we move the end in and out, you can see that it compresses the gas inside. When we compress the gas, the molecules of air are being forced close together. The pressure is increased and they're desperate to get away from each other. This creates a force acting on the piston, trying to return it to its original position. If we release the piston, you can see that it pops straight back out. But will an early piston have enough power to launch a missile? Richard Windley has created a replica of the machine, first seen in the deserts of Egypt thousands of years ago. The arm from the piston comes out here, so that's the kind of thrust rod or connecting rod for the piston, and there's a large cam here which is connected to the actual arm of the catapult which is pivoted a bit further back. As we pull the arms of the catapult, you can just see the cams operating and pushing in the pistons. This is compressing the air and it's given us effectively a kind of air spring. This is achieved using only the power of what is all around us, air. The catapult would have shot 35 centimeter bolts with a wooden shaft and an iron tip. Fantastic, we actually hit the target first time. I was somewhat surprised, in fact, that um, we got the kind of range that we did. We were getting 40, 50 
yards range with this and the arrows are flying very very straight the actual height or trajectory is, is um, a slightly more complex issue but it would be quite easy to get used to one of these things and probably hit a target of a meter square at um, 60 70 yards but if it was such a success why did piston catapult technology disappear from the history books for so many hundreds of years Quite why they didn't use it, I think, is probably due to the fact that they had problems getting an air seal, and that is absolutely crucial. And, and that kind of um, unreliability in the field would, would make soldiers be very, very wary of it as a weapon. Had they perfected the air seal, the piston catapult would have become the elite catapult of the ancient world, capable of launching projectiles weighing several tons. This is what its successor, the modern piston catapult, does today on an aircraft carrier to launch a fighter plane, well, they use a steam cannon that actually fires the plane off the end of the aircraft carrier, and that really is sort of taking the idea into its final and most modern form. It gives us the capability to accelerate aircraft weighing 55,000 pounds from zero to 165 knots over a 300-foot distance in less than two and a half seconds. The principles explored by Tisibius save military lives every day. This is the front of the catapult. It's called the battery position. This is where the aircraft gets secured to the shuttle, which is attached to the rest of the catapult. Within the launching engine are power cylinders that run the full length of the catapult. Within the cylinders are pistons that are linked to the shuttle, which are next to the aircraft. When you're ready to fire the catapult, it's a programmed opening of the launch valve which admits steam into the cylinders, pushes the pistons forward. When it gets to the end of the power stroke, the aircraft is permitted to continue flying. 